Right, ladies and gentlemen, with the previous lecture, we've started with chapter 8 in the textbook of Sengel and Kajar. And uh, this chapter is on internal forced convection. And uh, just to give you a quick revision, because it has been a week or two ago that you had the previous lecture, I hope that you'll remember that we've said that internal forced convection is, there's one big difference if you compare this type of work with external convection, and that is that usually, or in many cases, the two boundary layers will meet. If you've got two parallel plates and boundary layer at the bottom, one increases with thickness from the entrance, then the same happens with the other boundary and at the stage usually they meet. And this cause, and the result of that is that we have to be very careful to distinguish between developing flow and fully developed flow. I've also addressed with you the issue of the average velocity and the average temperature distribution that we work with in a pipe and or a tube. I've also <laughs> said something about the differences between pipes and tubes and we also addressed the issue of the hydraulic diameter in terms of how to calculate it. So for all other geometries which are not round, if you do not have very specific detail information, then you can change that, change that geometry so that it becomes a circular tube and then you can use the definition, you can calculate the Reynolds number by using the hydraulic diameter as well as the Nusselt number. Right, then uh, we also uh, looked at the equation, the theoretical equation that says that um, the velocity boundary distribution will be fully developed uh, will be fully developed if we calculate it as 0.05 multiplied by the Reynolds number multiplied by the diameter. You've done that in fluid mechanics. With heat transfer, there's only one term that is added, and that's the Pranel number. So it is then actually equal to 0.05 Reynolds Pranel multiplied by the diameter. Take note, this is a theoretical derivation, and I've mentioned to you that we've recently showed that it should actually be 0.12. So it is more than double that length before it takes to get fully developed. And this is a very important issue to know when you design heat exchangers. For turbulent flow, fortunately it is always within 10 diameters, the flow is fully developed. And in general, if we look at uh, thermal, thermal analysis, then we can divide the problems in two types of problems. It can either be a constant heat flux problem or it can be a constant wall temperature problem. Now with the previous lecture I've asked you to divide your page in two so that you can see this next to each other so that you can see the differences. So this is the left side of my page and that is the right side of my page. This is schematically how we show a constant heat flux. Constant heat flux, something like Q dot H. Uh, you can also just write Q dot is equal to constant. So this can be, for example, an electrical resistance element that is being used on the outside or joule heating, or it can be from a nuclear reaction. With this type of problem, the amount of heat for every one millimeter that the flow would flow into this tube, it will get the same amount of heat. Okay. With this one, it is different because the wall temperature remains constant. And if this temperature is lower than that temperature, then the biggest temperature difference will be at the inlet, but then the flow will start heating up and the temperature difference between the wall and the flow is going to decrease. So that is why they are fundamentally two different problems. So with this type of problem, if we look at typically the fluid that is being heated, then the temperature distribution will increase linearly. So that is Ti and that is Te a linear increase in temperature. 
Now that is a big advantage because you can actually know exactly what is the average temperature as the flow develops through the tube. The wall temperature is going to do something like that and then like that. So that is the temperature of the surface. Uh, take note, this Ts is now not equal to that temperature. Well, let me rather use Tw for the wall. That's better. Tw for the wall. Um, and let's... I can't use W now for the water, so I'm going to use Th20. Okay, so that you can distinguish the two. So that is typically how it looks like. And why do we have this? This means that the temperature, this, the temperature difference at the beginning is, very, is, is much smaller. Why? Because the heat transfer coefficient is much higher because the boundary layer, layer is at its thinnest. So the flow is developing mm. up to there. DEV, remember that is what I've used previously to indicate the flow is developing and from there on FD, the flow is fully developed. Right, now if you go and look, go and do a thermal analysis, then you can say that the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat flux multiplied by the surface area of the tube and that is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. Okay? Now if you're going to solve the outlet temperature as a function of the heat flux, then you can rewrite this equation as the outlet temperature is equal to the inlet temperature plus the heat flux multiplied by the surface area divided by the mass flow rate at Cp. <coughs> With these types of problems, it is a huge advantage if we can also get the outlet temperature. Sorry, this would of course be the outlet temperature of the water that I'm, that I'm referring to. So that is the outlet temperature of the water. If it is water on the inside, it might be something else. Okay. Now, we can also go and write this in a general format by saying that the mean temperature of the water, Tm is just the mean temperature of the water at any position x, is equal to Ti plus uh, Qs multiplied by the area, which is now P multiplied by X, divided by the M dot Cp. So P multiplied by X is just the surface area, and P, in this case, is equal to pi multiplied by the diameter, if it is circular. So the surface area, AS, is in general equal to pi D multiplied by the total tube length L. But if we want to know what is the surface area as a function of X, then we can just write it as PD multiplied by X. You see that? Okay. So the constant heat flux case is the easiest of all of them. Something that I'm going to not do with you in detail, all the details are in your textbook, is to use this now and go and look at the temperature profile and the velocity profile and go and look at the control volume and look at the force balances. So I'm going to jump that and the result of that is that you can now prove that the Nusselt number would be equal to 4.36. So analytically, you can go and solve that the Nusselt number is equal to 4.36 for a constant heat flux condition, and that would be actually only for FD. So FD means it's for fully developed flow. I'm just running, I'm just running out of space here, but remember, 
what we've said is that the heat transfer coefficient as a function of x is going to do something like that and that would be fully developed flow fully developed and this value here that value there is the Nusselt number of 4.36 so the fully developed Nusselt number is 4.36 okay. any questions on this part of the work do you understand that for constant heat flux condition constant heat flux condition and for laminar flow maybe just for safety it is good if you actually can add here for laminar flow okay now for the constant wall temperature case is a little bit different or much different and that is very important and if we now look at the temperature as a function of x and let's suppose the wall temperature is higher than the temperature of the fluid on the inside then it means that that temperature there is going to remain constant Ts and as I've discussed previously if this wall is maybe at 100 degrees Celsius and you've got water flowing in here at 20 then here at the inlet the temperature difference is going to be 80 degrees Celsius okay so that would be Ti and if this wall is very 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 long infinitely long then this temperature will become of the water will become 100 so it gets less as it flows downstream so the temperature is going to do something like that of the water let's assume it is water flowing through the inside okay, now we are not going to we don't have time for the derivation but you can go and do it at home but what you can do now is derive that the outlet temperature is equal to the surface temperature minus Ts minus Ti multiplied by E to the minus H surface area multiplied by m dot cp outlet temperature this temperature here te of the water is equal to the surface temperature minus the temperature difference between the two streams multiplied by e to the minus h area the surface area multiplied by mcp so just as previously if you would like at any position x to know what this temperature is you can go and write this equation as the temperature x for the water if it is water is equal to ts minus ts minus ti e to the minus h and the surface area is just the perimeter p multiplied by x divided by m dot cp so just to repeat the p is the perimeter if it is a circular tube then you can write p as pi multiplied by the diameter this term here is very important and in my opinion doesn't really get enough recognition in this textbook because if you design heat exchanges you can learn a lot from this term this term is also being called the number of transfer units the NTUs and that is then equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area oops, divided by the mass flow rate and CP why is that important it is important because if we go and look at the NTUs and the outlet temperature and we look at the problem where the inlet temperature is 20 degrees Celsius and the surface temperature is 100 degrees Celsius 
and the NTUs is 0.01, then this outlet temperature is going to be 20.8, typically. What would that mean? It would mean that from there to there, there's almost no increase in temperature. It's only going to increase with 0.8 degrees Celsius. So if you want heat transfer, then this tells you that if the NTUs are low, then you're going to get very little heat transfer. Your heat exchanger is not going to be effective. If the NTUs become one, then the outlet temperature is going to increase to 70.6, so there will be a 50 degrees increase in temperature. If it becomes 3, then that temperature is 96. If it is 5, it is 99.5. And if it's 10, it is 100. So if you look at this, what conclusion can you make from it? Remember, we've got, let's suppose, water coming in at 20, the wall temperature is 100. It tells us that if the NTUs are 3, then it is within 4 degrees C of the wall. Okay. If the NTUs is 5, then the temperature is going to be 99.5, so it's almost the surface temperature. And from 5 to 10, the temperature is going to increase just with 0.5 degrees Celsius. So from here to there, you've doubled the length of the heat exchanger. So in general, sort of as a rule of thumb, we would say to be avoided. So if you des des design a heat exchanger, and the NTUs start becoming three and higher, then you start wasting material. <clears throat> right, now something that is now different, and we've discussed this previously, is that for this case, remember we are still busy with a constant wall temperature case, that the heat transfer rate can be written as the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area multiplied by LMTV and not the temperature difference as we've done previously here. Oh, well, it is like that, but sorry, I, I'm going to explain just now. Okay. So the LMTD, what is this LMTD? The LMTD is equal to the delta T on the left hand side minus the delta T on the right hand side divided by the lin of delta T on the left hand side and delta T on the right hand side. And we are still going to do this a lot and it will become clearer for you as we use this. In the textbook it has been written a little bit more complicated in terms of TI and TEs and TSs etc. So it can look very complicated, but I'm going to show to you that it is extremely easy. So for this case, it is very important that we rather make use of the LMTD method if we make use of the heat transfer coefficient, if we make use of the heat transfer coefficient. Now again, you can go through the derivation and what is now different from this derivation, where you've got a constant heat flux, where the Nusselt number is 4.36, the Nusselt number is now going to be 3.66. And again, this is only valid for fully developed flow. So just like in the previous case, if we look at how the Nusselt number develops as a function of x, it's going to do something like that. And that is going to be fully developed flow, and that is going to be developing flow, and this Nusselt number here is going to be 3.66. So take note, it is just the fully developed part, it is not that part. While it is developing, it will be higher always than 3.66.
Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. Let's do an example. To this example, we've got a tube. with an di inner diameter of 25 millimeters. We've got water flowing through it. And the inlet temperature is 15 degrees Celsius, and the mass flow rate is 0.3 kilograms per second. And they also give to us the outlet temperature is equal to 115 degrees Celsius. Then, they also say that here on the outside we have condensate, condens, con, con, condensate, condensation occurs here. And because of that, the average heat transfer coefficient is equal to 800 watts the square meter degrees Celsius, and this condensation occurs at a temperature of 120 degrees Celsius on the outside of the tube. Okay. Now you have to go back to your thermodynamics. Your thermodynamics, your TS graph, temperature entropy, is your saturation lines. What does it mean if you've got condensation? Condensation means you have a gas which is superheated, then it is saturated, and from there on it starts making liquid. But while it does that, the temperature remains constant at 120 degrees Celsius. So in heat transfer, we like things like this, where there's condensation, boiling, and or evaporation. Of course, the temperature remains constant on the wall. The latent energy, there's lots of latent energy. So that is why we are very happy about this. So if you look at this, you will understand why we would say that this temperature of the wall is constant, is 120 degrees Celsius. It's a constant wall temperature problem. <laughs> It is not a constant heat flux problem. Right, so if we go and look now at, again, the temperatures as a function of X, then the wall temperature remains constant at 120 degrees Celsius. So that's Ts, the wall temperature. Okay. What they've asked us to determine is to determine the length of the tube required that can do that. What must they do? It must take water at 15 degrees Celsius and it must heat it to a temperature of 115. So it must be within 5 degrees of that temperature there. When the water enters, it will be at 15, and what is going to happen with it? it its temperature is going to increase. And every time as it goes downstream, the temperature is going to keep on increasing. So the temperature profile is going to look at something like that. So that is the temperature of the water. You've already heard of the bulk temperature. The bulk temperature we can calculate as the inlet temperature plus the outlet temperature divided by two which is equal to 65 degrees Celsius. The heat transfer rate is equal to the mass flow rate, the Cp, 
multiplied by the outgoing temperature minus the inner temperature. Mm. The mass flow rate is given as 0.3. The CP of water is 4187. The outlet temperature is 115. The inner temperature is 15. So it's going to be uh, 125.6 kilowatts of heat transfer. Okay, we have to determine the length of the tube. So, it is now easy. We can say that the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area, the wall temperature minus the bulk. The heat transfer rate is 125.6 kilowatts. It's equal to the heat transfer coefficient. The average heat transfer coefficient is 800. The surface area, it's a circular tube, so it is pi multiplied by 0.025, multiplied by the length, that is what we want to determine, multiplied by the wall temperature is 115, minus 15, and from that we can determine the required length as 36.3 meters. Do you agree? <coughs> Why not? Ah, sorry, sorry. Okay, uh, 115 minus 65. Okay? You agree? Anybody who do not agree? Make my day. Why not? Why did I use? The, oh, okay, sorry, sorry, okay. Um, yeah, 120. Is that right? The wall temperature 120 minus this temperature is 65. Yes? Yes, okay. So, good. This is incorrect. Okay? But this is the thing that many people will do. And if you look at the sketch, you'll see why it is wrong. Do you see? Because the average temperature distribution is not Ts minus Tb. Because that is the temperature distribution that we've used in there. It must be the LMTD, because what the LMTD does is it actually do an integration of that E term, the E to the minus N to use, and give us a much more accurate uh, description of the temperature distribution. So let's go and do it the right way. The right way is that the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area multiplied by LMTD. Okay. Now take note of the LMTD. Okay. I want to ask you, don't write. I'm going to give you an opportunity to write. Just, just look in terms of what I'm going to do on the board now. The LMTD and that's the advantage of making a sketch, is on the left-hand side, this temperature distribution. <coughs> that temperature distribution is 120 minus 15. Okay? This temperature distribution minus this temperature distribution. 120 minus 115 divided by the limb of that term, 120 minus 15, divided by 120 minus 115. Okay? So, 
it is this temperature distribution minus this temperature distribution and you take the limb of the two minuses. Okay, it's very simple. It's very robust also if you work with minuses, minus temperatures, I mean you can get with refrigerants, you can get temperatures of minus 20 or whatever, but as long as you keep this, as long as you do this, it will always work out correctly. Right, so the LMTD is equal to actually 32.85 degrees Celsius. So coming back to this graph, the LMTD takes this area and in principle divide it by the length. So it gives us an average temperature That is delta T LMTD. Okay. Take note, it is, not, it is not that temperature minus that temperature. Okay? So it is not that temperature minus that temperature. It is a good description of the real temperature difference between the two streams. Right, if we now go back to this equation, the heat transfer rate is 125.6 kilowatts is then equal to the heat transfer coefficient which has been given as 800 multiplied by the surface area is pi multiplied by the diameter multiplied by L and now we use a temperature difference of 32.85 the correct temperature difference And if you go and calculate the length now, it is equal to 60.86 meters. So compare it with our previous calculation, it's almost double. So it makes a huge difference, very important. Any questions? Right. Now up to now, or with these two derivations, the profile that we've looked at can be any type of circular profile. So what we've done is, um, sorry. Uh, so could you have used that equation then to, um, to um, get the length, the one next to the, at the uh, surface temperature? Uh, which one? This board, uh, first board. Uh, this, this board. Yeah, that one there. Yeah. We have used that one to get the length. Yes, you can do it with that one also. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. So what you can just do is you're going to say p moment multiplied by l, and you can calculate it with that equation also. It's a little bit more difficult, but yes, you can do it directly with that equation also. Okay, coming back to this derivation, we've written this as multiplied by the surface area. And here I've said uh, P would e be equal to pi multiplied by the diameter if it is a circular profile like that. But then there are other profiles that we might also be interested in. And they are summarized in table 8.1. And they are summarized as firstly the geometry and then A divided by B. And then they give the Nusselt number and they would give it for constant wall temperature, constant heat flux and also friction factor. Now the first geometry is the circular one, is the one that we've considered just now. 
this is not going to be relevant. Uh, that would be the diameter. Okay. The surface, if, if, if the surface temperature is constant, then the Nusselt number would be 3.66. If it's a constant heat flux problem, it will be 4.36. And the friction factor is 64 divided by the Reynolds number. Why is that relevant? Because in heat transfer, that is normally the cost. We pay for it in terms of a pump, dumping, pumping the fluid through a heat exchanger or a fan. So normally we are interested in that also. So the circular tube is summarized like that. And then there's an example of a rectangular tube where that is the dimension A and that is the dimension B. And if this ratio is equal to 1, then it would be uh, a square, a square tube. Then uh, this Nusselt number would be 2.98, that would be 3.61, and this would be 56.92 divided by the Reynolds number, just as an example. I'm not going to write down all the values for you, but they go on there to a value typically of 8. And then uh, this value is equal to 5.6, that one is equal to 6.49, and that one is 82.32 divided by the Reynolds number. And there's also the geometry of an ellipse, and then also of a triangle in terms of certain dimensions, in terms of A, a and B. And from tables like this, you can also get the necessary information. Okay? So in the textbook, it is just five or so of them. There are, there are many more, but you will have to go and look in the literature for them. Okay. okay, so now I would like to come back to the fact again that if we look at a laminar flow case and it's a constant heat flux or a constant wall temperature, then we are so happy that we can get the Nusselt number, we sometimes forget what it actually means in terms of what I've explained to you previously. So it is very important to realize that if we've got flow through a tube now and we look at the Nusselt number as a function of x, then that would be 3.66 and that would then be the case for a constant wall temperature Ts. Okay. Now, for the case of a constant heat flux, there is 4.36. And what is important now is that the fully developed part for the constant wall temperature and the fully developed part for constant heat flux are not the same if we would typically plot it on, a X, on an X graph. However, there were people who did some work on this and they have found that actually you can rewrite it a little bit and then things are actually much easier. So again, that is the Nusselt number, and then they're going to show these as 1 divided by the Graz number. So GZ is the Graz number. And the Graz number is equal to um, X divided by D uh, multiplied by Reynolds Prandtl. Sorry, D divided by L. D divided by L, so you can write it like that. And then if you go and replot these two curves, then you get to this magic value of 0 0.05. And what it does, what it then shows is that these two flow would be fully developed if 1 divided by the Graz number is equal to 0 0.05 and that is where the 0 0.05 comes out in terms of the equations which are being used 
to determine the hydrodynamic length, Reynolds multiplied by the diameter, and the thermal one is 0.05 Reynolds Prandtl multiplied by the diameter. So this value of 0.05 and that value is the same value. <coughs> Now remember, this has been determined theoretically. The equation that we've published this year actually shows is, it is equal to 0.12 Reynolds Prandtl diameter, and that is what we've determined experimentally. Experiments. Okay. So don't use this equation now in this module, because it's going to co cause confusion if some of you are using this one and some uses the other one, so you can just take note of this. Okay, so what is, what is now very important is if you must go and design a heat exchanger, then you would say, okay, that is now great. I know that the missile number is going to, be e going to be equal to one of those two, but it is in this region. I need to know it also there, isn't it? because it is obviously important. So people did some work on that, and we can go and determine that with the so-called Edward equation. Okay. And take note, this is for a circular tube, specifically a circular tube, and this equation says that the average Nusselt number is equal to 3.66 plus 0 0.065 multiplied by D divided by L multiplied by the tunnel number divided by 1 plus 0 0.04 D divided by L Reynolds Prandtl to the two thirds. And that is equation 862 in your textbook. Equation 862 in your textbook. Okay, now take note, because of the Graz number, which is equal to D divided by L, Reynolds uh, Prandtl, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, I think they, I've missed the Reynolds number there, Reynolds Prandtl like that. Then, we can rather write it as 3.66 plus 0 0.065 multiplied by the Graz number divided by 1 plus 0 0.04, the Graz number to the two thirds. So it's less calculations to do it like that. What is very important is to realize that this equation because people go and interpret this now different, differently. They would say, all right, I've got a certain length and now I want to know what is the Nusselt number at that point there. So the Nusselt x. Okay. This equation does not give you that value. It is a very nice equation because it will actually give you the average. So for that reason, I would actually prefer showing that in an equation like that to indicate it, indicate it is the average and it is the average over the total length of the heat exchanger. In the textbook, there's also an equation for, again, flow through two flat plates, okay, two flat plates with a constant wall temperature. So it is given there, you can take note of it. And then the last equation it gives is the so-called Cedar and Tate equation. Cedar and Tate. And that was developed, oh, I can't remember the year. And this Nusselt number is equal to 1.86.
multiplied by Reynolds Trundle diameter divided by the length and then multiplied by the viscosity at the bulk viscosity divided by the viscosity of the fluid on the surface to the 0.14. Okay, now students have lots of problems to identify which one of the two equations to use. I'm usually lazy, so I'm trying, I prefer to use the, the one that is the less work. What is different here, not only with this equation, but with many other equations, is this term. And the question is, if I've given you a problem like that, if you go and read this, it says that this equation should be used where there's big differences between the viscosity on the wall and the viscosity on the surface. Now what is a big difference? Well, it is a judgment call. So if you look at this term, and you go and calculate it, because it's to the power of 0.14, and let's suppose this is equal to 0.95, okay, then it will only make a 5% difference on your initial number. Okay? If it is, of course, equal to 0.8, then you start making a 20% error. So depending on your application or depending on what you know, it is one of those things that you need to know and or take into consideration if necessary. And in many cases you do not have to do that. Okay. Now, what is missing in the textbook is the equation for a constant heat flux. So now we've got this equation that can give this missile number for us. But there's nothing in the textbook on this part. Now although this part is sort of theoretically more easier to determine because you can track the bulk temperature of the water, the mean temperature very accurately, there is no simple equation for it. There is a so-called theoretical equation of Kashar of uh, 1987 and the equation is something like this 11 divided by 48 plus 1 divided by the 2 and the sum of n equal to 1 to infinite of a term cn and rn 1 and exponent to something long to the minus 1. The details is not important okay and in terms of you, these values, you have to go and get them as the eigenvalues of this problem. So it's lots of calculations to determine that. Take note, theoretical. The only equation that is available is the equation that we've published this year, Marlies, Everts and I, which is the equation of Meyer and Everts, which is an experimental one, 2018. And it looks like this, the average initial number is equal to 4.36 plus initial 1 equation plus initial 2 equation where the initial num number, initial 1 equation is something like this, 1 divided by L multiplied by a few terms, the initial 2 is equal to 1 divided by L a few terms. So it's still a few calculations, but it predicts 95% of the data with an error of 5%. So it's very accurate. You don't have to use that in this course. It is maybe for your postgraduate course we can look at that. Okay? So any questions, ladies and gentlemen? If not, then thank you very much. Then I'll see you again next week.